Now, as a dad, I enjoy a good pun. I enjoy a good dad joke, you may say. Um, and so uh, some of the best ones that I found as I did my study this week uh, came with company slogans. And apparently, plumbing and septic and portable toilet companies are the best at these puns. And so I'm going to give you a couple of those, and then we'll, we'll do a few other ones here. But um, one that I found was a plumbing company in Atlanta called, get this is, this is their name, Royal Flush, already pretty clever. Their slogan is, the only time a flush beats a full house. Wow, that's uh, pretty good. All right. Uh, next is a septic company, also very clever. They say, striving to be number one in the number two business. So, <clears throat> enough of that. Let's go on to a towing company here. A towing company says, we don't charge an arm and a leg. We just want your toe. So, there you go. T-O-W, toe. Okay. Okay. Well, sometimes the summary of a person's life is put as an epitaph on their, uh, their tombstone, and I found a few interesting ones this week. Uh, this one caught me as a father of five, uh, only one daughter, but a fa father of five. This epitaph says, he raised four beautiful daughters with only one bathroom, and there was still love. You know, that is something special. <laughs> the tombstone of a dentist said, Walter Brown is here filling his last cavity. <laughs> this one's a little mean. But uh, poet John Dryden's epitaph for his spouse, he wrote it for his spouse, says, Here lies my wife, here let her lie. She's now at rest, and so am I. <laughs> this one maybe is also just as mean. Here lies Ezekiel Akel, age 112, the good die young. So, um, Elvis Presley's last words in his final press conference where I hope I haven't bored you. That is uh, uh, appropriate for him. And Voltaire, a famous atheist, said this in his last words on his deathbed. A priest asked him to renounce Satan. And he said, now, now, sir, now's not the time to be making new enemies. So, last words, epitaphs, slogans, will and testaments. These are the things that we read in 2 Samuel here as we come to the end of David's Life. We read his final words. And if you look at the passage today, the chapter 22 really, if overlaid over top of David's life, tells his story in a poetic way. And appropriately, he gives us two poems in this two volume biography of his. And so the first one he writes, which is a summation of his life, he probably writes it around 40. He probably writes it before the whole incident with David and Bathsheba. Um, with Bathsheba and Uriah, I should say. And then the second one are his final words that he gives on his deathbed. It's important for us to see what the author of First and Second Samuel is doing here. In 1 Samuel, we have a prophecy from a prophetess named Hannah who gives this prophecy about who is coming, the king that is coming. And then at the end, we have this story from David, this poem from David showing that he has fulfilled everything that Hannah prophesied. And this is how 1 and 2 Samuel are concluded. And it's the end of David's life that what we're going to see is we're going to see three truths that we can help build a godly legacy. Three truths we can help build a godly legacy with. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would take this word, you would impart it to our hearts. God, you would help us to know and understand you better today. God, that we wouldn't leave here the same people. God, but we would leave here changed. Whether we have a relationship with you or we desire to have a relationship with you, I pray that none of us would leave here exactly the same as we came in the door. God, you're a good God that loves us, cares for us, and gave us your word. And so, Lord, today we depend on that. We throw ourselves at your mercy. The grass withers and the flower fades. The word of our Lord stands forever. Amen. So the first point about your legacy today is make your legacy God is my hope. Let's read verses 2 and 4 one more time. He said, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer, my God, my rock where I seek refuge, my shield, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold, my refuge, and my Savior. You saved me from violence. I called to the Lord who is worthy of praise, and I was saved from my enemies. David understood this, that God was his hope and everything he had in life, everything he faced in life, anything he needed where, where he needed strength and he needed a shield and he needed a refuge, God was there for him. Think about this. 
That God was his refuge and strength when he was anointed as a little shepherd boy to be king. Could you imagine being 10 years old, being anointed to be king, and knowing that one day you would be king, and possibly the current king wasn't going to be very happy about it? You have to know that that crossed his mind. But he knew in the midst of that that God was going to be with him. He believed in himself, not because he had great self-esteem, but he believed in himself because God believed in him. And that was what, what was, that's what was important. So he knew that God was with him. God was his hope. God was his hope when he went out to face Goliath. Think about the situation when he goes out to face Goliath. He's not much older at this point. He goes out with a sling and a rock and no armor on, and he faces God, he, uh, Goliath with God's power. He faces Goliath with God's power, and his armor is God himself and defeats the giant. When David calls on God to be his rock, the interesting thing is he calls on him while Saul is chasing him, and God literally gives him a rock to hide in and run around. There's a mountain where if you trace where Saul and David went, it's like they just keep going in circles around this mountain. As Saul chases David, God gives him a rock. But what David understood was that rock was just the tool that God used, and, and God's true, God was the true rock, his true refuge, his true strength. God was who he put his hope in. And when we look over the life of David, the good and the bad, what becomes clear to us is that everything in David's life was because of God's goodness, God's power, God's faithfulness to him. Because, especially as we get past the early stages, you know, we see him, he's this, he's this little shepherd boy, and he you know, has a lot of potential, but then later on in life, he really kind of goes off the rails, and we talked about that for several weeks. And what we see is that though he had this appearance of strength, David really turns out to be just as weak as everyone else. He just turns out to be a weak man. Everything in his life was from God. Hudson Taylor, missionary to China, said this, All God's spiritual giants have been weak people who did great things for God because they reckoned on God being with them. This, Taylor nails it. The greatest Christians that you can think of throughout history were men and women who knew that if God wasn't with them, they would be failures. But they trusted in God's power. They trusted in God's faithfulness. And they put their hope in Him for success. So what does that mean for us? Well, if you're a parent here today, how should we think about raising our kids? See, our hope for parenting and being a good parent isn't going to be in our skills. Although you, there's, there's skills to parenting, there's things that we should know, there's books that you could probably read, and I have several of them I could give you if you want to know some skills. But ultimately, our hope for parenting is in God. Our hope is in God's grace to our children. I want you to think about this as you try to do all the right techniques. God, the perfect heavenly father, the first two children he had rebelled against him. And to think that that could happen to God, it means it can happen to us. And so our, our, um, our hope in our parenting is not that we would have all the right skills. We have to throw ourselves at God's mercy to work in our children's lives. What about for our marriages, for husbands and wives? Your hope for your marriage isn't in your ability to kind of hold things together, to have better communication skills, although those are good. To go on regular dates, you, you probably should, to whisper sweet nothings in your boo's ear, you know? Maybe you should do that too. But that's not what the hope for the marriage is. The secret to a successful marriage is both of you trusting in God and His mercies and developing the patience of Christ in your life in the midst of that marriage. You know, God gave you your spouse not for your satisfaction, but for your sanctification. That your spouse comes into your life and is like sandpaper to sand off those rough edges, and you do the same for them. I won't look at my wife who is sitting on the front row right now at this moment, but she would <laughs> agree. Uh, even just yesterday, she was helping me shave off some rough edges for sure, and I'm grateful. But ultimately, your marriage is not about your satisfaction, but about your sanctification. Your confidence in the future doesn't come from how much you earn or save. It comes from your hope in God himself. You, you know, we should save money. We should be responsible with our finances. But your confidence is going to be in Christ who can supply and will supply all your needs according to his riches. 
Your happiness in the future isn't determined by if or when you find your soulmate because you may never get married. But your worth is not determined by your relationship status. It is determined by a God that created you, loves you, and made you and brought you into his family. And the honest truth is, is that he may have more planned for you than you could have ever done with a family. There's this fascinating passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 where the Apostle Paul is like, hey, listen, guys, marriage is really hard. It's really difficult. It's a big distraction. And we got a lot to do for Jesus. And for most of you, you're probably going to get married. I understand that. That's kind of what Paul says. I get that. That's probably going to be what happens for a lot of you. But there are going to be some of you that will not be married. And could it be true that God wants you to stay single? And this is what he says in verse 35. God wants you to stay unmarried so that you may be devoted to the Lord without distraction. And if you think being unmarried is weird now, you should imagine it in the first century. It was, it was this is totally countercultural what he's saying there. And if you see it as a weakness in your life, something where you didn't achieve what you wanted, understand this, is where you see weakness, the Lord sees strength and opportunity. Because your hope is not in your relationship status, but it's in the Lord. Your hope to get to heaven isn't in your ability to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, to be able to uh, be good and do all the good deeds that you think you should complete in order to be a good person. You see, you're not ever going to be good enough to be able to reach up to God and grab him. You're going to need a Savior that will reach down to you and grab you and pull you up from destruction. See, David realized that his hope ultimately was not in himself and not in his skills and his ability. He's a very brilliant, uh, good-looking, uh, strong uh, king. But that's not where his hope was. It was in the Lord. And David eventually realized that God had orchestrated his life to teach him this. Let's read in verse 7. I called to the Lord in my distress. I called to my God. From his temple he heard my voice and my cry for help reached his ears. Over and over and over again, difficult circumstances, many of them David's own fault, but not all of them, come against David. And in those circumstances, he is forced into situations that will make him put his hope in God. He has no other choice than to do it. Is it possible that God is bringing you through a difficult season so that you'll stop trusting in yourself and lean completely on him for your hope. There's an old story about shepherds and wandering little lambs. If a little lamb would wander away from the, um, the, uh, the herd, the shepherd, legend goes, would break a leg of the lamb and then mend it. And that lamb that wandered off, because it, the lamb wandering off was a death sentence for that lamb. It was, if it kept doing that, it was not going to live. And so he'd break a leg, he'd mend it, and then he would place the lamb over his shoulders until that leg healed for those weeks that the leg would heal. And when the leg was healed, the lamb would not walk away from the shepherd because it was so connected to the shepherd that it never wandered away again. And there's some truth in that for us today. God may be using difficult circumstances in your life so that you trust in him more. He may be doing it in your parenting, in your marriage, in your job, in the addiction that you're fighting, or your relationship status, or the relationships with people in your family. Where are the places that you're experiencing heartache and frustration and failure? God wants you in those moments not to depend on yourself and try harder, but ultimately to lean on him as your hope and do what David did, which is this. I called to the Lord in my distress. I called to my God, call out to God. Hudson Taylor again says this. God wants you to have something far better than riches and gold or personal charisma or talent, and that is helpless dependence on him. Helpless dependence on him. That sounds pretty weak. And our society tells us we can't be weak people. We have to be strong. We can't depend on anyone. We have to do it ourselves because if we have to depend on anyone, we're going to be disappointed. But God wants you to learn to depend on him. So he says, depend on me. Put your hope in me. 
I've heard it said by other preachers, if dependence is the objective, weakness becomes an advantage. If dependence is the objective, weakness becomes an advantage. And what that means is that you have to be careful about your strengths. You have to be careful about the things that you're really good at because those are the areas that you are tempted to not follow God in. Those are the areas you're tempted to take control and seize control from God because you think you can do it. Be careful about your strengths, but boast in your weaknesses because those are the places where you experience God the most because those are the places you have to put your hope in him. Now, we should put our hope in him and our strengths. We should put our hope in him and our weaknesses. But it tends to be, because of our human condition, our weaknesses are the place we most put our hope in him. So often, he'll put us in places and situations where our weaknesses are more prevalent. And we should take joy in that, that we get to know our Savior and Lord through those times. So make your legacy, God is my hope. But secondly, make your legacy... God is my Savior. Point two, make your legacy. God is my Savior. Let's look at verse three. My God, my rock, where I seek refuge, my shield, the horn of my salvation. The horn of my salvation, I had to look that up. I didn't really know what it meant. The horn of my salvation is referring to the horns of a bull. So you can think of a bull using its horns to knock uh, something or someone out of the way. So he's saying that God was like a bull and saved me as he charged my enemies. So that's what he's saying there. My shield, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold, my refuge, and my savior. You save me from violence. I think what's so interesting about this passage is when David writes it, like I said, in his 40s, probably before the whole Bathsheba incident. David writes it thinking that the main way that God was going to save him was from his enemies. But what it turns out being is the main way that God was going to save David was from himself. See, by this point in the story, David is at best a complicated figure. He's a sinful old man who's done some really, really terrible things. Things I don't even want to repeat here again. It's at this point that we begin to realize that this book actually isn't a biography of David. It's really a story about something else, someone else. And, I, you know, one way I can prove it is in 2 Samuel, there is no death for David. We, we get his last words, but we don't get his death written about in 2 Samuel, which is strange for a biography. You always kind of tell the death, where it was, how it happened, that kind of thing. You know, we hear the death of King Saul, who was killed on the battlefield, but we don't hear the death of David. And that's because First and Second Samuel isn't primarily about David, but it's about a greater king who could be everything that David wasn't, a king that could truly, actually fulfill the prophecy of Hannah in full, a king that we all long for, a king that when we even today look at our political figures that we want to put our hope in, that maybe they can fix what's going wrong in the world, maybe they can do what's right, you know, that desire, that feeling that we have is really a feeling for a king that is better, a king that is greater. A king that doesn't need a rock of salvation, but would be the rock of salvation. A king that we would take refuge in. A king that would deliver us and be our salvation. And it's at the end of David's poem here in chapter 22 that we hear this king, hear about this king, get, get a glimpse at the future of this king that is to come. To come. Uh, David says this in verse 51. He is a tower of salvation for his king. He shows loyalty to his anointed, to David and his descendants forever. Who is he? He, about a thousand years later, angels would, in the town of Bethlehem, sing a song, and they would say this. Today in the city of David, a Savior was born to you, who is the Messiah, the Lord. That he that David refers to, that rock of salvation, is Jesus Christ. See, David needed a Savior that would save him from his own choices, his own decisions that he made, his own sins that he committed. And he couldn't do it on his own. He was un even King David was unable to save himself on his own. He needed a Savior. He needed Jesus to do it for him. And this was so beautiful about Christianity, what's so beautiful about the gospel and what I love so much is that every other religion spells salvation D-O, do. 
Do good things. Do good deeds. Be a good person. Be honest. Be kind. Uh, donate enough money. Work hard. And if you do enough, you make enough good difference in the world, perhaps one day if you're lucky and you arrive before God at the right moment in the right circumstance, He will save you. They spell it do. But the gospel spells salvation D-O-N-E. Done. The salvation is a gift that you receive, and it's not about God rewarding you for what you've done, but it's about what Jesus has done for you. And what we see is that the good works that we do, and we should do good works, we should be kind people, we should be honest, and, and we should be generous with our finances, all those things, those things are a, uh, uh, the, those things are a result of salvation, but not a means of salvation. We get those backwards. We always think that the good things we do are going to be the things that save us, but that's not what the gospel is. That's not what Jesus says. The good we do is a result of salvation, not a means of salvation. R.C. Sproul, the theologian, said this, the only works of righteousness that serve to justify a sinner are the works of Christ. That Christ was the only one that was good enough and whose deed on the cross was good enough to save us, the perfect, sinless Jesus. And so your legacy, may people know that God is your Savior. But number three, make your legacy, God is my refuge. This is such an interesting passage. And when Samantha was reading it, it was just hitting me again. I want to read it again with you, verse 22. For we have kept the ways of the Lord, for I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not turned from my God to wickedness. Indeed, I let all his ordinances guide me and have not disregarded his statutes. I was blameless before him. <laughs> let me read that again. I was blameless before him and kept myself from my iniquity. So the Lord repaid me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness in his sight. Now, after reading the story of David, let me tell you what David should not want. David should not want God to repay him according to his righteousness because it wasn't going to be good. So what's going on here? What is, what is happening here in this passage? Well, the first thing is, well, you say, well, you said he wrote it probably before the whole incident with Bathsheba, and that's, that's probably true. But when it's put in the book by the author of 1 and 2 Samuel, the, he, he knows what David has done, and he still puts this in the book. It's so strange. So what's David even doing here? What's he talking about? Is he exaggerating for effect? Some people say that. It's a poem. So he's exaggerating for effect. Not that he was actually righteous. Not that he was actually good. He's exaggerating for effect. You know, that's, that's fine, but he really doubles down on it. It's not like just like one little phrase or something. He really goes down and, and says, I was basically perfect, which is wild to me. The next thing uh, scholars say is, well, he's recognizing his positional righteousness because of Christ before God, as in this, all right? He's not actually righteous, but because he trusts in God, he received Christ's righteousness. And now when God looks at David, he no longer sees David's sin, but he sees Christ's righteousness. And I think that's definitely a part of what's going on here. It's definitely a, a, a thing of what's happening with David when he says this. But I, I like that another pastor took it actually further. And he talks about this idea of new creation righteousness. New creation righteousness. That David is reflecting on the power of God, not just to cleanse the believer, but to restore the believer. Let's look at another psalm that David wrote, Psalm 103.10. He says this, He has not dealt with us as our sins deserve or repaid us according to our iniquities. He has not done that, not repaid us according to what we deserve. And then we go back to 2 Samuel 22, verse 21. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. He repaid me according to the cleanness of my hands. And so not only does David receive the righteousness of Christ in trusting in God, but David is no longer judged by his evil deeds, but only by his good works. And this is what is known as new creation righteousness, that we have, we have been um, restored as believers. I love what he, what he says in uh, continuing in Psalm 103, verse 12. He says, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us, which is infinitely far, right? They're infinitely far away from one another. Our sin is that far away from us because of what Christ has done for us. So maybe today this can be helpful for you. Maybe today for some of you this will change your life. But because of Jesus, your life can be defined 
by the good you do and not the sins you committed. Your life can be defined by the good you do and not the sins that you committed. Today there may be things in your life that you're ashamed of, things that you don't want anyone to know. There may be ways that you've labeled yourself. You've labeled yourself a, a cheater, a coward, a compromiser, a failure, a thief, a criminal, an addict. But God has a new label for you. Stop dwelling in the shame of your past and get on with the good that God has for you to do. And say with David, God is my restoration. God is my restoration. And in Christ, I am a new creation. He not only forgives me of my sins and not only does he see me as Christ, but he doesn't count any of my sins against me and he counts all the good that I do for me. Ephesians 2, 8 and 10 is one of my favorite passages in all of the Bible, and it says this. For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift, not from works so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship. Some translations say his masterpiece. Created in Christ Jesus. And what are we created for? We are created to do good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. God created us for good works. God saved you for all the good that he wants to do in your life. And you no longer have to be defined by your sin or the labels you put on yourself. You can be defined by Christ and the good he's done in your life through saving you and the good that you do out of his salvation for you. This is really cool. That word workmanship or masterpiece in some translations. Do you know the Greek word for that? I'm going to tell you. You probably don't. It's the word poema. And it's where we get our word poem. You see, like God did for David, God is writing a poem about your life. And the refrain of that poem is not your sin, but it's the good that you've done after Jesus forgave you. And that's the beauty of what Christ does in our life through the gospel. And it's no wonder as we get to the end of this poem that David writes about his life that David says this. He says, therefore, I will give thanks to you among the nations. Lord, I will sing praises about your name. Because he had no other choice. He knew that everything that he had gotten in life was because God gave it to him. And the only choice he had was to praise him. See, God's cross offers you forgiveness from the penalty of sin. He gives you the power to overcome sin. He gives you the power to overcome the, uh, the damage of sin. And because of the gospel, you can leave a legacy in your life where God is your hope, God is your savior, and God is your, restor God is your restoration. God is your hope, God is your savior, and God is your restoration. God is doing a work in you and making a masterpiece, a poem out of your life. Will you let him today? Let's pray. Jesus, today we come to you as people that often relate to David. Maybe not exactly in all the ways that David was good and David was bad, Lord. But Lord, we do understand that our hope is only in you. We know that Without you, we would never be saved. And we know that you've come into our life and you have restored us. God, that you are doing a good work in us. And I pray that we would live in that. We do everything you've called us to do. God, you have given us everything that we're supposed to do for you. So Lord, give us the strength to do it through your Holy Spirit. Today, if there's those in the room that have never trusted in you, They've never put their hope in you. Lord, I pray that today could be the day that they do that. Lord, that they come to the end of themselves and they say, I've tried. I've tried to be good. I've tried to do all these things and I've tried to earn my way and I've failed at every attempt. Today, Jesus, I trust in you. So Lord, I pray that today that would be true. Lord, you'd be working in hearts and lives. Thank you, Jesus, for your cross. Thank you for your resurrection, proving that you had the authority to forgive us of our sins. We pray all this in Jesus' name.
Amen. This media has been made available by Arborway Community Church in Boston, Massachusetts. At Arborway, we invite people to walk with Jesus together. If you would like to check out more resources, learn about Arborway Community Church, or donate to this ministry, please visit arborwaychurch.com. Thank you.